Hi everybody, Avisaik. Uh, I'm back for another video. This is part two of bouncing back. And um, again, it's for informational purposes only. So, where I left off, okay. Um, gonna jump right into it. So, we are hardwired and conditioned to look first for what's wrong, what's negative. Uh, this is basically called uh, a negativity bias. Uh, and we probably developed this um, over thousands of years, you know, think about it, thousands of years, things were pretty uh, precarious for humans. You know, we had to be on alert. When are we going to be attacked? Whatever. Um, so that's probably why we have that negativity bias. And often, uh, you know, there were, it was dangerous times back then. Um, most people now, uh, you know, usually aren't in those dangerous situations. I mean, obviously some are, but I mean, for the most part, uh, our body might trigger uh, these feelings of anxiety in non-threatening, what are really non-threatening, non-dangerous situations. Okay. Um, now, you know, individuals with uh, trauma often have a hard time relaxing for fear of just letting their guard down, you know, and being vulnerable. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting sort of dynamic. You're trying to get rid of anxiety. We're trying to rewire the brain. But, you know, sometimes if you're a, a victim of trauma, you're experiencing that and your know, therapist is working with you and getting you to relax and you're, you know, kind of like, oh, I'm relaxing. I'm getting even more uh, keyed up because I'm feeling vulnerable. So you have to kind of work with, you know, little micro steps to make progress sometimes. Now, the author um, references uh, Rick Hansen, you know, Buddha's brain, um, the author of Buddha's brain. And he uses uh, the phrase, taking in the good to refer to the process of pausing, to let positive experiences sink deeply into the mind and the body. Um, so basically uh, by referencing or by uh, focusing uh, attention on these moments, you know, like of generosity and honesty and, you know, however we're experiencing some pleasant uh, situations with, uh, with other people. Um, our brains then can develop these habits and move us beyond surviving to thriving. And I think of a Seligman of positive psychology back in the 90s that talked about, you know, getting past just surviving to thriving. Now, one thing to remember when we're dealing with the negatives and the negative thoughts, and negative feelings, uh, we don't want to just try and suppress them because that might just work on a very temporary basis, but then they're going to kind of come back and, you know, rear their ugly head. Uh, basically, what we want to do is replace them. So if we've got negative thoughts going on, we want to... Instead of suppressing them, we want to replace them with positives, okay? And that's kind of a universal given now that um, we need to uh, replace uh, behaviors, thoughts, rather than try to suppress them if we're going to make some, you know, meaningful, uh, enduring uh, change here. So, <clears throat> it is, um, it's real easy to fall into a negative mindset because that's the way we're wired. And um, we can develop what's called a confirmation bias. There's a lot of info out there on confirmation bias. I've done a video on it, um, where we tend to just start seeing just negative out there. And that is just, you know, kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy sort of scenario. Uh, so that's why we want to kind of let our prefrontal cortex uh, get involved in this equation and start noticing and uh, making note of all the positives uh, that are out there. Now, she mentions uh, in the book, she mentions forgiving. And it doesn't mean that you have to condone um, behaviors that say were against you, you know, you don't have to forget or, you know, uh, any of that. Um, but the, the practice of forgiving really does kind of help us 
maybe close the door on a chapter that has been bothering us. Um, and I've talked about this, I think, in my anger uh, management video. Um, you know, the idea is if we're going to forgive somebody for doing some sort of harm to us, what we're really doing is we're really actually helping ourselves here. Okay. Uh, and why is that? Because <clears throat> if that situation has been gnawing away at us and eating away at us, um, you know, and we've gotten to this negative mindset of this person did that to me, blah, 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 and then you start ruminating about that. Okay, that's not going to help you. Uh, that's going to have the opposite effect. But if we can actually forgive the person, uh, not condoning the action, but we can forgive the person, maybe we can close the door on that chapter of what happened and, you know, move on. Now, some therapists will actually um, recommend giving a gift to the person who harmed you. Okay, so this is the person who was harmed giving a gift to the person that has harmed you. Now, it's a hard one to process. You know, I, uh, I still think about that one. You know, maybe it would uh, fly with me if uh, it was a situation where the harm was minimal. But you, you'll have to make your own determination about whether that's something that could that you could do. Um, but I think the idea is that it's kind of like a another gesture, almost like a ritual. Uh, you've gone through this particular action, and sometimes doing those those actions uh, tend to uh, help with closure. Okay. Um, Let's go on to some practical sorts of things that she mentions in the book. So she mentions, you know, if we're upset watching uh, the evening news and then stay upset through dinner and staying in this reactivity, um, all that does is just add to, you know, our suffering and <laughs> probably to the suffering of those uh, around us. And what I do is um, I kind of just limit how much I'm going to watch. And, and most of the time, I'm actually, if I'm going to get the news, I'm reading about it. I go on like smart news and I can kind of pick and choose what I'm going to read about. I've noticed that uh, if I listen to the broadcasters on the news, a lot of times they have this emotional charge. And I don't want to get caught up in that, um, you know, emotional charge that they're throwing out there. Um, sometimes it can be contagious. All right. That's that's, you know, my take on it, you know, and you can kind of determine what you want to do there. But that's my take on it. Now, she mentions that um, uh, the fast way to mitigate stress is through safe touch and warmth in a soothing relationship. So any warm touch, hugs, snuggles, you know, holding hands, etc. cetera, uh, that can trigger the release of uh, oxytocin and bring the body back into a state of calm. She mentions like I believe it was oxytocin as I read my notes. You know, I'm thinking endorphins, that sort of thing. Um, now, even our own touch um, can have this result. And I think Siegel is the person who actually mentioned that, but don't quote me on it. So if you don't have anybody that you're close with, that you feel comfortable with, you know, in terms of giving a hug or anything like that, well, the, <clears throat> the self-hugging uh, really seems to help. And, of course, you can always rely on pets. Uh, I've got plenty of pets, and, um, you know, you, I, you can hold your pets, your dog, your cat, whatever animal that you have. Um, I was going to say that, you know, my, my, my cats are unconditionally love me, but I don't know if that's true because, you know, I think they always want me to feed them. I don't know if they'd hang around if I didn't. But in any case, um, you know, I, I do hold them. I, I pet them. They purr. And actually, I feel better, and I think they, they feel fine, too. Now, the book mentions uh, vagus nerve stimulation, uh, where you can massage the, the back of your neck, you know, where it kind of meets with your uh, your skull there. And um, that helps, um, you know, relax you and, and feel good. And um, an, another important note, she says, you know, step back, reflect on experiences that are triggering old reactive responses. Okay. 
And she says, when you notice and name those responses, uh, you're strengthening your prefrontal cortex in its function of self-awareness, which is creating new options. The idea of naming, um, that, that's something that um, you'll see in a treatment for um, individuals that have suffered trauma. Um, and when you name uh, what's, what you're going through, if you name anxiety, you know, as a, you give it a name, uh, you say, this is, I'm feeling anxious here. Um, that helps put your, your thought process in your prefrontal cortex, as opposed to just experiencing that anxiety and it's staying kind of in your limbic system, okay? So the idea of naming actually um, helps. And I like to actually reframe. I can say, yeah, it's um, uh, anxiety, and, and now it's kind of moved to... Uh, excitement depending on the situation you know I, I've got a whole different video on that on reframing um, but the idea is actually giving that experience a name seems to help and of course what we want to do uh, as she mentions is replace ants or you know automatic negative thoughts with APTs or automatic positive thoughts now the, the trick here is that like I said before we have this negativity bias wired into us so we're gonna have to work on um, these automatic positive thoughts. So we have to really practice and practice. And uh, she mentioned switching the channel. So if you find yourself ruminating on old negative thoughts, you're gonna switch the channel to positive thoughts. Um, remember, we're not gonna suppress them. We're going to replace those thoughts. That's real important. So let me give you a quick uh, summary of uh, everything and basically the, the the main point I want to emphasize and you know as I mentioned before I'm gonna review the book but I'm also giving you my take on things and my take uh, in this is a, a regular practice these techniques that she mentions um, need to be practiced regularly so in my estimation you'll need to practice and monitor um, how effective they are. So if you're doing these uh, techniques, you know, these, uh, you're trying to add, you know, these automatic positive thoughts and you're adding them to a daily routine, great. And now I wanna, if you can rate how it's going every, you know, if you're working every day on these techniques and if you're making some headway, excellent, uh, keep it up. Now I know a lot of people have trouble uh, <clears throat> keeping up a routine. So if, say you say, okay, yeah, I've done it every day and things are looking much better for me. Um, <clears throat> if you slack off, <clears throat> excuse me, if you slack off to three days a week, a week, is it still giving you benefit, the same benefit? If it is, great. Um, you know, maybe you've hit a, a maintenance uh, level. But if it's, not you might have to increase that frequency of working on uh, those techniques again so you're going to be playing with that a little bit and in my estimation this is not something that you would want to entirely stop um, i you know in the past i've used like hypnosis and visualizations uh, to help me like you know if i was going to do a, a speech or something like that uh, i would work on visualizing what i was going to do and it always was very helpful um, but I noticed that when I stopped doing that, then I went back to my default level, you know, where I'd be, oh, I'd get a little bit more keyed up, so I'd have to practice, you know, the those um, visualization techniques that, uh, that worked for me. So um, I think if you're going to get a point out of this is, you know, make sure that you work on doing these techniques um, on a regular basis basis and monitor how frequent uh, that regular basis uh, needs to be for you to get a benefit out of it. Okay, I hope that was helpful and I'm done. So long.